Dirty Hands means clean theology. Can you dig it? What's going on, all my local guys and gals and long distance pals? How are you guys? We're back. We are back. Drop the ball, Sorry. Sorry. Drop the ball. Hold on, let's try it again. We're back. (laughs) Need that deep, raspy voice. Back. Like mine? Like, we're back. We're back. I'm a real boy. Yeah. (laughs) Well, guys, what's going on? Well, this week for you. Hopefully, tomorrow. I'm going to get a shipment of chickens in. Little baby chicks. Little baby chicks. 80 of them. Mm. It's an eight with a zero. <laughs> it's going to be a bunch. That's a lot of chickens. Yeah. It's a lot of nuggets. We are, they're going to uh, be yummy, too, when we eat them. <laughs> we are all trying to be a little more uh, self-sufficient here, as, as especially as uh, our groceries and everything else are twice the price they were even just a couple years ago. So uh, it's crazy. I actually have... Um, about 40 quail hatching this weekend too so well just like our uh, sponsor you know the the better insurance agency or the better quote he said uh with the the price of bread slowly approaching the day's wages that's, that's, <laughs> that's right that's important to save on your insurance that's right yeah, we're seeing the bible come into fruition here uh right now right before our faces i tell you well i want to ask a question which i already know the answer to did anybody catch the Grammys? What? No. The Grammys? What's that? What's a Grammy? You know, that's where all the elite get Gra- together. Graham you know, crackers? All, all, all the music. I thought you were talking about my grandma. Graham crackers? Well, apparently there was like a big uh, satanic ritual. Yeah. That, that I seen, oh, I heard, I heard about that. I seen that on uh, JP Reacts. <laughs> Did he react? Oh, he was. He was reacting. Yeah. He's pretty, pretty rough. It's crazy how they don't even try to hide it anymore. That's what he said, yeah. I mean, it's just boom. Just God dancing like the devil, dressed well, up like the isn't devil. That, isn't that pretty crazy how much of a, a, an attack on God, a blatant open attack on God, and we see that stuff more and more in our culture and more and more accepted. That's or, the or, problem. Or expected. Not just accepted, but expected. And you see that. It's it's put on display for everybody, and it's it's sad, but... Uh, it's what we see, and this is the problem with, with our common culture right now, is that it's everywhere. What we have to worry about is our kids, because what happens is that this stuff is, is slowly and, and very methodically and is being fed to the next generation. And what does the next generation do? What are they, what are they? They're always on social media. They're always on their phones. They're always on something. They're getting spoon-fed this, the, this agenda that it's not a positive one. It's not from God at all. And I, and we can see that blatantly when you talk about stuff like this. And what I think's just astounding is how people just chalk it up to shock and awe. Other oh, artists just doing this stuff, you know, to sell records and be, you know, wild and crazy for attention, you know, like Ozzy Osbourne and the Bat and, you know, just... That's, Marilyn Manson, they dress up and do all this stuff just for shock factor. That's just that's just their excuse to do it, to to make it okay to do it. That's all that is. Or to accept it. Right. Well, same thing, you know. It's, I will, and, you know, like our topic today, was it Nike or whoever had the blood in the heel of the shoe? <laughs> Well, that was that Nas X guy. Or and whatever. even the name Nike, a lot of people don't realize that. That's a, that's the a name of a foreign god. The Greek god of, I think, victory. Hmm. I don't know. I didn't yeah, know I mean, that. This, this stuff's everywhere. No, I always worshipped Reebok. Did you? No, I'm kidding. Reebok reason. <laughs> the Reebok of reason. The Reebok of reason. Yeah, I can't. Let's not go back to last week. That was, or last, uh, last show was a little rough for me. I, that I guess, that I was here for. I wasn't here last week, so I apologize. Which we got a lot of good uh, responses out of that. Uh, I mean, we the downloads were through the roof in the response for that and I've seen people on our community forum talking about how it was just uh just mind blowing for them. You know, how they never realized that and how everybody how you're basically spoon fed from a young age, you know, the, these ideas and things and it's when you look in for yourself that that's not, not the it. Fact. Yeah. yeah. That was me. Yeah. That was me. You yeah, you had some shock and awe. It, well I did the research and we looked in and, and really got after it and then 
when, saying it out loud after that was painful. Like it, it hurt because y- you believe one thing a certain way your whole life. You look at look at on our dollar bill, and look at it saying in God we trust. But and then look at some symbols on the back. But that's not and well, and you, look you at know, all those, yeah, the the all seeing eye or the pyramid and all the different things that are on there. But the fact of the matter is that that the in God we trust is the God of reason. It's not, it's not the God that we worship. It's not the God that, that sent his son to, to, to save us. It's, it's a complete lie. Yeah. But it's all preconditioning and, and programming, you know, even like with our, you know, music artists, you know what I mean? Affecting the kids and Satan knows who to, who to influence. He picks the influencers the ones that uh, the younger generation want to emulate and imitate. And and that's like the whole thing with the Hollywood stuff, you know. That's all it is. Yeah. And they're the influencers right. of our society. I want to be like this person wow. or this. I think that's what you say. We keep going down that road and you look at what do we glorify in Hollywood. We oh, glorify yeah. right now it's all the Marvel stuff and all that DC that's straight. stuff. <laughs> and that is straight. I, yeah, all these I mean, different gods. I mean, and I gods, know I yeah. go down that road a lot, but that's straight Nephilim stuff that we talk about. When you talk about Diana, who was Wonder Woman, right? Yeah. Was was um, was Artemis, right? I mean, that's the, the same the same God that they worship right. back then. This is somebody who was uh, one of those lowercase g deities at that time back then. And we're glor- Thor. Right, we're do- we're glorifying these people that were really you know, Hercules. All these different things. These are these are things that are from our past that are things that God warned us against. But yet our culture today glorifies these things, and and we put them at the forefront, and we call it entertainment. And maybe it doesn't affect you or me, but does it affect our kids? Oh, it, is it affecting I, see, your neighbor? See, what I think is it's not even it's not even that you, you say it's not affecting me, but it is. You just might not be conscious enough to realize it. Which I think this needs to be a future episode all in itself, you know, pop culture and oh, symbolism could be. and, and yep. stuff like that. That could be a whole podcast. Yeah. A spinoff. I mean, that's how crazy that is because it doesn't stop. Because that's not what today's episode's about. No, not I'm at sorry. All bunny trail. We, we're, went we're on, we went on a rabbit trail wait, wait, already. Wait, wait, go ahead. Let's back it up here. All right. All right. <laughs> Steven, you were out last week. We're glad you're feeling better. Yes, we sir. We missed you with all our technical difficulties. He's, he's like, he has through. a special touch for some, I don't know. You're welcome. Well, open us up in prayer and we'll dive right on, on in today. Dear Lord, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for blessing us through this show. Help us reach that one person that we always talk about. If we can re- help one person become closer to you, have a better relationship with you, then this whole thing has been a success for us. Please use us in, in any way that, that you see fit. And Lord, just continue to work through us and help us say the words that everyone needs to hear. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, today's subject matter is power in what? Well, the name, the blood, both. Well, we're gonna we're gonna dive in, aren't we? We yeah. are. Let's get our hands dirty. Clean theology. Yes, sir. Let's <laughs> dig. Can you dig it? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I guess. When we, I guess we should start on the, the, we have, we have two different schools of thought that I think that, I think there's a little bit too much of a divide here. I think that, um, you can't put all your eggs in one basket, but at the same time, we have to know where that comes from, where that power comes from, if that makes sense. Um, because if we, if we start looking into, uh, you know, if we start with the power in the name. Right. And we we talk about this. If we if we look at I mean, there's, um, you know, actually, it's it was it's over four thousand times 
in the King James Version that the word God is used. Did you know that? It's like 4,400 and so I, I had it written down. Um, and I apparently lost that sheet. I have a lot of sheets that I uh, <laughs> prepared for this one. But um, the word God is used throughout the Bible a lot, right? But when we go through this, if you look at just a few verses to get us kicked off, but uh, like Philippians 2.9, you know, God gave him a name above all names, you know. Uh, Romans 10.13, for everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, or Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There is, I mean, you could go on forever about verses that talk about the name of God. And it, it shows us that, you know, God's name is important. It's very important. Which before we get too deep into it, I just want to, you know, kind of go, I guess, chronological and go back to the history you know, where it came from. Then you got to back it up. We're going to back it up. All right. Beep, beep, beep. That's not how you back it up. Uh, well, how do I back it up? You just got to say it. We, we don't you have just, buzzers on our... You just you our, just have to you just have to look at everybody and say, it. let's back it up. See, his, his nick, nickname should be like Sir Mix a lot. He knows how to uh, back it up. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest archaeological evidence for the divine name is uh, from the mid-14th century BCE. You know, this is the period of the judges. In an ancient temple uh, calling the Israelites the nomads of Yahweh. You know, the oldest sacred writings are what's called the, the Silver Scrolls, dated back to the 7th century BCE, just before the destruction of Solomon's temple. It contains uh, words from Numbers, chapter 6, uh, verse 24 through 26. But... The Jewish people in their scrolls didn't use the divine name. They used Elohim or Adonai, meaning Lord. This started around the time of the exile. You know, either they felt it was too holy for their lips to utter, or they were just afraid to use it while they were in captivity. So I guess, you know, the the question that I see a lot online is, you know, does pronunciation matter? I would say I would say no because I mean obviously I barely speak English as it is so but if you're speaking to the Lord or about the Lord you, you know we you he's going to know you're speaking to him I mean it's it's God he he already knows so so I guess part of this is you have to go back and once again look at the the culture at that time we always look at that we always try to look back through their eyes and and, and try to use that um you know the way that heiser gilbert would would talk about is you know you have to look at the the way through the the eyes of the people the writers in the bible um but even even straight through there so they had a lot of names for god you know hebrew names um you know, names that the, the Jews would use. They actually have seven separate names that they deem so holy. Seven. Seven names that they deem so holy that you're not even allowed to erase them. So, I mean, they really take the name of Jesus very seriously. And I think I, I 100% believe that. And I think that the the name of Jesus, the name of God, uh, is, is, is very important, but... I, I'm going to jump in a little bit here and, and talk about, I, I have right here, and I recommend if anybody can find this, as, as far as you can find almost anything in here, I have the Holman Illustrated Pocket Bible Dictionary. And um, I have, this has things in it that I it blow me away. Um, and I've learned a lot from this. Just if I'm reading through my Bible and I find something that I don't understand or know or, or, or there's a something that's capitalized or in parentheses that, you know, you know how the, the writers of the Bible did these things where they would put something extra in to, to, to kind of show you it's important, even though maybe we don't know at face value when we're reading through. A lot of things I found in this dictionary and it, it elaborates on those things. But I thought it'd be interesting to jump into the names of God. And... Um, we can go through and, and, and we can look at the Hebrew names. Um, one of the big ones, and, and actually I've been to a um, bat mitzvah. And, and, or, 
Uh, no, I went to a bar mitzvah. Sorry, I went to a bar mitzvah, not a bat mitzvah. A bar mitzvah is for the boy, bat mitzvah is for the girl, right? But I went to a bar mitzvah, and they go through, and one of the the um, things that they have to go through is to read some of the scripture, right? So, and they have to read it in Hebrew. But when they're when they're reading, the, you know, the the Hebrew text, you know, they're reading the name of God, and a lot of times, uh, probably the most common that you hear is the Adonai, right? You hear that a lot when they're reading the text. Um, but I I think it's really important to understand, right? We're we're reading a Hebrew name, and when we see, you know, Adonai, or and you know, there's certain ones that everybody's heard. Everybody's heard Yahweh, right? Everybody's heard Adonai for the most part, or El Shaddai. You know, there was that that Christian, I don't know, it was Amy Grant or somebody like that sang that song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, and I, I can't remember the whole the whole song. But anyway, that it's, it's, those are popular, more popular um, Hebrew names that are that are out there. But there are a whole bunch. There's uh, El Elyon, El Olam, um, um, El Roy, um and then there's Yahweh Jireh, Yahweh Nasai. I mean, there's so many different names, but I think it's important to look at the translation, right? We translate the other words so we can understand it, but let's translate what the name of God is so we see what, what it says to us, so we see that. So if we say Adonai, it means, you know, Lord or Master, right? If we say El Shaddai, it means all-powerful God. If we say... Um, El Elyon means most high God or exalted one. You know, El Olam means the eternal God. And you can just keep going right down the list of how that's translated into, you know, God or judge, ruler. But it's all exalted terms to show how great God is. Right. So it, the, the translation would be God, the all powerful one, God, the great one, God, the exalted one. It It is descriptors it's adjectives to show how great god is those names titles exactly they're titles but we have to translate things into our language so we understand it not everybody understands hebrew and i would i mean i'd put a couple bucks on the fact that god doesn't only read hebrew i would think that potentially god you know he might know english you know i hope he does because that's how i pray to him so right i mean it's the only I, language I know. <laughs> I hope. I hope. But I just think and that... we're Southerners. We barely know that. Exactly. I'm, well, I wasn't going to say anything. Well, but. It's all right. <laughs> hey, you're part of the group now, buddy. Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, if you want to go into... Oh, uh, which I was just going to go on, you know, basically, the name, in my opinion, you know, it's not so important what names and pronunciation when, when they are important is you know is wiccan witchcraft you got to pronunciate the words just right to get the spell to work and and i think you've said it before you know that's that's putting the creator of the universe in a very small box and limiting god yes 100 percent. and honestly there is no scripture that commands that any word must be perfectly pronounced not even his name but the Bible even records that even within the Jewish people, different areas had different accents. You know, you can go to Judges uh, chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. It says they even had trouble hiding it. You know, like I said earlier, think about us. You know, we're Southerners. We can't even get our own language right. But one thing that stood out to me was, was Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. It says, For by people of strange lips and foreign tongues, the Lord will speak to his people. I mean, it says it right there. The language is not important. You know, God uses Gentiles, foreign lips and tongues to speak to his people, the Israelites, that are you know still struggling to believe in Jesus Christ to this day. And uh, if you guys are ready, uh, we actually had a conversation with uh, Dr. Judd Burton uh, a while back, and we actually talked on this topic, and we want to play that clip for you guys. You guys ready to dive into that? work for me let's dive in i heard a podcast that you'd recently done and yens were talking about this whole uh new age movement and with uh Mm -hmm. the hebrew roots and 
basically what, what mm-hmm. Paul talks about is the the Judaizers, and I loved your take on that. I, I, I'd love to to touch on that with you because that's that's something that I see really on the rise, and and it's my opinion that it's 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 a, another one of the great tricks of, of the devil to to enslave God's people and put them back in the chains. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I loved your thoughts on that that podcast. I just I wanted just to have a little discussion and pick your brain on that real quick certainly but with that i mean it's like i see all the time you know people fighting over the the true name of god you know Mm -hmm. all the scholars throughout all the years you know have come up you know with you know with yahweh Mm -hmm. now there's this new bible out called the the cipher and they're saying that all these you know men uh, and learned scholars were wrong that it's a it's Yahuwah, mm-hmm. and um, and that all the time when you see you know Lord in all caps in your Bible, it's not a sign of reference. It's a trick from the devil to remove the name of God from the Word, so you don't have the mm-hmm. power because Scripture says over and over again, "There's power in the name." There's power in the name. What's your your thoughts on on that specifically? Well, that is other than that, it's balderdash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. If you want to call God Yahweh, that's fine. I mean, there uh, we have approximations of, of what that would have sound like the the, the Hebrew letters, um, which transliterate as Y, uh, you know, YV. Uh, what is it? Y YHVH. Um, but you know, it's the same sort of machine that they push the name of uh, uh, they do the same thing with jesus the name of you know yeshua yes. okay yeah that was his name in hebrew well but if you use if you use the name jesus then you're using the greek language and that's pagan and uh well what they're not understanding is the transliteration of a word so jesus is yeshua it's just the closest greek equivalent It's like, okay, I was working on an archaeological dig one time with some students from the University of Athens, and they never called, they couldn't, couldn't say my name exactly, Judd. So some of them would call me Yuda. Well, I knew, I knew what they were, I knew they were talking to me because that was the closest approximation that they could say because none of them spoke spoke any english or hardly there was one guy that spoke a little and he called me johnny i still knew that he was talking to me (laughs) you didn't ignore them because they didn't get the pronunciation right i didn't ignore them or denigrate them because they didn't pronounce my name correctly Uh, and so it's a matter yeah it's something that, that goes beyond you know it goes that relationship that you have with god it goes beyond simply the use of of human tongues okay so me that argument is dead on arrival that if you don't if you're not addressing that if you're not addressing that by the jewish name you know that that to the people that he offered this revelation to it it just it, it to me it shows a misunderstanding of 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 transliteration and title and the misunderstanding that there's something deeper going on between just spoke you know between you and god than spoken language um and so you're not you know accidentally worshiping some pagan god you know by calling god god or calling him you know whatever that's all a matter of of will i also did a, an episode with the guys at camp Herman, you know about the accidental pagan yeah you know, you're not you're not gonna be accidentally wor- you know you're not gonna fool god in other words yeah um and so i think these these sort of legalistic you know supposedly linguistically based arguments that they make really don't hold a whole lot of water right that's what i say is always is that the power is not in the name the power is in the blood and it was jesus blood and the fact that you believe that right. is what gets you there god doesn't care what you call him i mean as right. long as as long as you you know i called you judd nelson earlier you knew who i was talking about but um, you're talking about, <laughs> but you know, in the end it's, it's the power is the fact that we believe in 
what God did for us. And, and when we say God, God knows who we're talking about. He knows who's in our hearts because we've asked the Holy Spirit to be there. So we know he's there. So that ultimately mm-hmm. is the, the key, mm-hmm. if you ask me, for but, what it's worth. Mm-hmm. But with the, the power in the name, now I've said this to some people, you know, in discussions on the forums and stuff like that, and I get dismissed, you know, but it's like my interpretation, you know, in, in Hebrew, you know, it was Hashem. You know, mm-hmm. the name. Well, you know, Hashem, you know, when you go into, I think it's Proverbs, it says, you know, a good name, a good Shem, you know, is to be valued over precious, you know, uh, gold and pearls and stuff like that. It ain't saying that, you know, the name Justin is better than the name Stephen. It should be chosen above all riches. No, it's, I, I always seen that as, you no, know, your representation, your name represents your you, your character. Yeah, yeah your character, your reputation. So it's like, yeah. you know, the power in Hashem, the name, it ain't power in pronunciating like a like a spell, Yahusha, mm-hmm. saying his name just right. You know, it, no, mm-hmm. it's you are his name bearer. You are representing mm-hmm. him by saying you are a Christian, and that's where the power lies. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Part of that, too, is it, it, you know, Jesus was his name while he was on earth, too, if you want to say Yeshua, because it never calls him Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, we talk about it as the angel of the Lord, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. also says that we will have different, like our our earthly names are not our heavenly names. You know, our names, we will have heavenly names. So what what we call God in heaven will be different than what we call him here. What, What God calls us will be definitely different than what we call what we're called here. So we, we were not bestowed those heavenly names yet. They're coming. And I, I honestly think it's sooner rather than later, but they're coming. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, but even the fulfillment yeah, of the law, it, you know, that's. I, the, well, and th- then we get into the, the muddied waters of the law itself. And what exactly does that mean in the Old Testament? What does that mean in the New Testament? I think it's pretty clear that they, you know, again, just looking at what the languages are saying, just let them say what they're saying. We're talking about an old covenant, an old agreement, and a new agreement. Yes. And what Jesus was railing against in terms of, he, and he, let's let's face it, he was railing against the interpretation and application of the law by the the temple infrastructure and the rabbinical traditions of his day, which had become legalistic in the extreme and what a lot of these uh the this the roots movement gets involved in uh has a lot to do with um you know paying attention to the 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 hebrew laws the levitical laws yeah um that that that's got to be a prerequisite you know for actually maintaining the law that that jesus and the disciples and the apostles talked about well jesus is really the he's the embodiment of the law and he's also the perfect sacrifice Uh, so he he is really the the nexus on which the old testament and the new testament swings and the the when you see the law pop up in most places where New Testament authors, particularly the epistle writers, um, like when John in his letters is talking about the law, the namas, he's not talking about Old Testament Levitical law. He's talking about this new vision of the law that Jesus presented, this, this the purest interpretation of the law, because Jesus distills all of that down, all, all of the, well, even the Ten Commandments, he, he distills down to, what does he say? Love your God with all your heart, all your soul. To the Shema. And mm-hmm. love your neighbor. So, and everything else falls in line after that. Um, and so Jesus is, is teaching a, a, a lifestyle evangelism that's not bogged down in legalism because legalism can become a hindrance to you know bringing somebody in into the fold yeah absolutely uh it causes dissension you know amongst the people that are that are debating it for the most part and um here's what it comes down to look if if god 
calls you, if you're a Christian and God calls you, he draws you towards those kinds of observances. That's fine. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. I think, I think the, the new, the new Testament should point Christians to the old Testament to look in, look, look into that. Those are the, that's the foundation of, of what we emanate from. And for, for Jews, the old Testament should point people to the new Testament. Um, so I'm not saying that there isn't some merit, you know, in understanding the law and understanding the old Testament. It's, it's fundamental. It's foundational. Um, but the ultimate sacrifice has already been made to satisfy the law. And that's you know, the, the he the, said he said Jesus said he's come to fulfill the law. So if it's mm-hmm. completed, then there's no law to have to work towards because it's completed already. Piggyback it off right. what both of you are saying. Romans two fourteen. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it. That's Romans 2.14 telling you your conscience, what's inside you, you know what's right and wrong, what God wants you to do. Right. The law is, is it's, it's it, and actually, and we go into this, we've said this before, whether it's, uh, what, 620 laws? 613. 613 laws. That the, 613 that Levitical the, laws. Mm-hmm. The Levitical laws that they're supposed to follow, but like over 200 of them you can't do without a temple that they haven't had in a long time. And, and guys, let's, let's mm-hmm. look around at our shirts right now. Are we wearing mixed fabric? Oh, wouldn't ever touch We're already in trouble. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that goes back yep, to Nephilim absolutely. too, right? Well, I mean, the see mixing. how easy it is to get bogged in? To get bogged down into all this stuff, uh, it's it's just uh, here, Jed. I'll, I'll help you. Just I killed that rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 just, it's it's almost laughable, you know. In in, in a lot of cases, it's a distraction. These that, that, yeah, these are issues that Paul resolved in in almost every one of his letters. Mm-hmm. You know, and it. I mean, hey, here's Paul. Here's a guy that knew this stuff backwards and forwards right and and i mean he was a pharisee yeah mm-hmm. this guy He's this guy he over. described him he described himself yeah exactly he described himself as a, a hebrews hebrew uh so here's a here's a guy who who completely understands the law and is continually telling people you know hey why would you go under circumcision why would you go go back under the law the um even ask them who, well, who has that, bewitched you, you yeah. foolish Galatians. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I say. In, in some way, shape, or form, virtually every epistle of Paul addresses this issue, some in more detail than others, like Galatians and Colossians. Uh, but, you know, he hits on this again and again and again. Well, I tell you, I, I can can only say uh, uh, half of uh, what Judd can say. I, I absolutely love Judd Burton and, and the stuff that he can – throw out there because he his knowledge base and the stuff he can pull out for us is just it's on another level so I think I think kind of following up on this and kind of just throwing one more thing into this that I I find really important and and seeing another another example kind of what Justin alluded to earlier too is is a little bit I'm going to jump into Acts and I'm going to read a little um section of acts uh, when the holy spirit comes right it says when the day of pentecost arrived they were all together in one place and suddenly came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans, how is it that we each hear in his own native language? And we go through the all the different nations. It's amazing God did this because once we talked about this before, is is this is Pentecost. 
God did this on purpose at this time because everybody had traveled to Jerusalem from all the surrounding countries, all the, the Jews from the lost tribes. Everybody came from different nations that all spoke different languages. So they could all leave and go back with the good news that they were telling them. God gave that that initial part of the church a spark for that reason. But the Parthenians, the Medes, the El- Elamites, the uh, Mesopotamians, the from uh, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, it goes right through Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome. And they were all samplings of the seventy nations yes. mentioned in Genesis ten. So this was, you know, we talked about this in our Bible study. You know, it was essentially a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Yes. In in a good way. Yeah, a reversal. <laughs> yeah, a reversal of Babel is a good way. But, uh, and what's crazy, we talked about how it wasn't maybe the tongues, that everybody was speaking one language necessarily, but everybody's ears were tuned to where they could understand every different language. And it makes you wonder if we were tuned to basically God's hearing aid. You know, we all speak all these different languages, but God can understand them all. Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, obviously, like a God frequency. They they got the God frequency. But from, well, obviously, if if He could make other people speak in other languages, then He could understand other languages. Let's just, I mean, let's just throw that out there. But I think it's really important to look at that and see that everybody was hearing the good news about God. And it says right here, we he that we hear them, and this is in uh, verse eleven. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So they're hearing about God in their own language, and and they're taking that information back to other people that speak their own languages. It's, It's about the faith. It's about the belief in, in the name that you're, you're professing. If I say, and this is, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, I think this is important. And we, we went, when we were at that spiritual warfare conference, we talked to like uh, uh, Tom Dunn was there and a couple other people there that, that really go into the deliverance ministry. And deliverance ministry is kind of one of those things that um, a lot of Christians are scared of, or it's kind of fringe to them, or they think of the exorcist. You know what I mean? It's, it's a little bit out there for them. And, but I think it's really important that if you look into the deliverance ministry and you look into exorcisms that have happened throughout time, and actually when we talk about the chosen and you look at that first episode when Nicodemus is trying to go in and exercise uh, Mary Magdalene, it's just really cool. But when you go through and you look at exorcisms and how, you know, when, 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 uh, Tom Dunn's talking about it, and when he goes through and exercises, you know, somebody or goes through this deliverance ministry process, you're telling that spirit to leave in the name of Jesus. That spirit, the 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 the, the demon that's inside that person, responds to the name Jesus. That's not his Hebrew name. They know your intent. They know who you believe in. They see your faith. And the faith that you have in God, the faith that you have in Jesus, and that's why they leave. It's not because you're saying an incantation, like you said earlier, Justin. It's not that you're saying the right things that you're cursing that demon or or saying something to that demon to go, other than the fact is you have faith in God. What what is what does uh, God say to the the Ethiopian? Your faith has made you well. Right. Right. That's well, what it is. It's not it's not the fact that you said God's name a certain way or that you said it's that you have a belief in that person. That, that faith behind that name. But you can use that name if you have the faith behind it and know it's the right, right person that right. you're talking about. So in The Chosen also, it's in a, I can't tell you which episode it is, but it has a, a character who's possessed, you know, another possessed person walking, and they run across one of, I can't remember if it was Mary or if it was just one of the disciples, and, and the demon speaking, it's like... It's like it. He goes, "Oh, what is that smell? I can smell it all over you," which he wasn't talking about the smell, like the actual scent mm-hmm. of the guy. It could smell Jesus on him, so it, it you know it knew. It's if to you, the same. Yeah, if you have a belief and a faith in God and in Jesus, yeah, it flows out of you. It flows out of right. you. Right, like demons are scared of that that faith, that feeling, because God protects you, God's around you. And that's the thing is that that power that's there, that power comes from God. That power comes from Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to tell you this right now, 
how do I know that, that, that that's the truth? Is because when I pray to God or I pray to Jesus to, to, for something, they answer my prayers. I feel it. I know it. I hear him speak to me through, through different things, mostly through scripture. But well, I know that I'm hearing God. I know that he's reaching out to me when I ask for something. Right. And it's not because I said something a certain way or I said something a different way. It's because God knows my intent. He knows my fate. Well, I look at it kind of in that same gist of things like, say, certain worship songs you listen to. It moves you. You don't get moved listening to rap or to country or to rock. Not like that. It's like a certain... I don't know, country moves me in the wrong way. <laughs> That's terrible. But you talk about the power like in the faith, you know I mean? I, I agree with you, but I kind of see it uh, in uh, with faith, but also, I guess, and with uh, the re- representation of, of the name. You know, every time you see name, the word name, you know, the original Hebrew word, it, you know, is Shem. You know, we kind of touched on it a little bit with, with Judd Burton there. But to, to go deeper, you know, it, it's the... It means the representation uh, or the character. You know, in, in Psalms, you know, it says a, a good name is to be chosen over riches. It means good character, good reputation. So it all goes back to name bearing. You know, when, when God called out uh, the Israelites from Egypt with Moses and they, they go to Mount Sinai and he gets the Ten Commandments, you know, despite what we're taught in Sunday school, when, when it says, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. It's not saying don't curse. Of course, you don't need to curse. Don't get me wrong. But what it, the context of what it's talking about is, is the whole purpose of him pulling them out, bringing them there to that mountain, is to set them apart and say, these are my people. And it even says, you know, uh, the, the marks and the signs are, are on their head. The head's where the authority lies. So his name is upon them. They are name bearers. They are his representatives on earth. So we are to represent God. So it's saying, don't say that you're a child of God and and do all the things of the pagans. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. Agreed. 100% agreed. And, and that is where the power lies. And honestly, the the law and the commandments, it even says that it was a tutor before Christ came because we couldn't do it. Jesus was the perfect representative of the name. In my opinion, that's why at the cross he said, you know, it is fulfilled. And that's where the authority lies. You know, basically, you know, like we talked about in the Founding Fathers episode, you know, our works are not our covering. Jesus is our covering. Mm -hmm. Works is just the overflow. It's the result. Right. If you, if you truly have a faith in God and you truly live the life that he wants you to lead, it's the good living water the flowing out of us is what it would be. Your cup overfloweth. That's right. <laughs> but I like how Judd said, uh, you know, well, this is the Dig Bible podcast. It's a ling- linguistic archaeology, you know, and that's not as exciting, you know, the, the study of, of words and, and history and stuff like right. that, but it's important. Mm-hmm. And I'd never looked into the, the names of the people in the Bible. And that kind of shows you where the, the divine name was revealed. If you look at the names, it's like, you know, you can ask, you know, well, when the divine name was given, well, yeah, you can look back and see textually when was the first time, you know, Yahweh or YHVH was used, but you got to remember this was written after the fact, all these things happened. And then later, Moses wrote them down. Mm -hmm. So he was writing these after the name was already given. So just because the first time we see it doesn't mean that it was actually revealed then because he's writing after the fact. But you can look at the names and get a pretty good idea. And it's crazy because before the divine name, and you went into some of the the names, you know, was Elohim, El Shaddai, you know, God Almighty. uh, These all reflect uh, times before the divine name. And some examples with those names is the the El from Elohim in people's names. You know, and some examples is, you know, Uriel, Samuel, Michael, Joel, Ishmael, 
Gabriel, Ezekiel. You know, all these have that that L, you know, God in their name. Uh, there's 93 L names listed in the Bible. Hmm. And what's crazy is after the divine name was given, we see the name shift. We see a ah, a h, reflecting you know the yah sound. That's how you can kind of see the name changed, mm-hmm. or at least the usage of it. And the examples of it is Zephaniah, Nehemiah, Obadiah, Jeremiah, Josiah, uh, Isaiah, Elijah. You know, I thought that was pretty interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, you can see the mm. the names right. change. Mm-hmm. So that reflects kind of of the the shift when the name might have been revealed. And then, and we before we get too far, uh, because I know we're about to jump into a, a different tangent altogether. I think it's important too, and we talked about it a little bit with Judd there, and um, I think we talked a little bit about it in the week. Uh, before that but when we go to heaven you know our earthly name our our name that's here is not our name in heaven jesus you know uh uh, yeshua whatever you want to say that was the name given to him at his birth however if and as doug van dorn can attest that jesus was throughout the old testament but he appeared as the angel of the Lord or, or as the word or as the name or as the, there's so many different the glory, places, the yeah. glory, different places that Jesus shows up in the old Testament. Christophanies. The Christophanies. Thank you. So he goes through that and shows up the tongue so nicely. It's my big word for the day. Christophany. I'll give you an A for today. That's a $20 word. right but, there. It is. I used all my money up. So, <laughs> Can but, I buy a vial? <laughs> But it's so important that we we see that that Jesus was there before he was called Jesus. So what what was what's his name in heaven? Because his name was Jesus on earth or Yeshua on earth. Yeah, well, Revelation says, you know, nobody knows the name. <laughs> yeah. And then and then when we get to and I talk, said that with Isaiah, it says, you know, world leaders are blinded by your glory and you will receive a new name by the Lord's own mouth. And then Isaiah sixty five fifteen. Your name will be a curse among my people, for the sovereign Lord will destroy you and will call his true servants by another name. So names in our, you know, and we talked about this with, was it Rick Hasty when we talk about God's outside space, time, and matter? We can't comprehend God. We have no, no there's no way. We can't put him in, in a little box. Like we said, you can't just say, nope, God, you can only do yeah, this. If you could comprehend him, and he wouldn't be God. No. So yeah, we so. get to that point and we see that we're all going to receive uh, different, we're getting glorified bodies and we're getting heavenly names. So, and Jesus didn't have the name Yeshua or Jesus until the time he was born, until God said he came into flesh. And then, then you know, the angel told Mary, this is what you're going to name him. Right. And she did. She didn't name and, him. And he wasn't the only one. There's many people by that name. Well. You know, he wasn't the only Jesus. No, no, for Joshua sure. Joshua at that time. Or Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Or even, you know, Joshua. Right. In the Old Testament. Yeah. You know. So it's just one of those things. I think it shows, again, that in, in the future, you know, in, in a heavenly plane, you know, not only are our bodies different, but our names are different. And I think it's an important differentiation, distinction to make that what we see on earth, you know, is is not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, our names, our, our bodies, they're going to be different. And also, I, when you have that mindset of the name being the the representation or, you know, the, the whole name-bearing, you know, theology, <laughs> it takes some of these passages that these power in the name, you know, people use into a whole new context. It changes the whole paradigm, you know, like, I got like three examples in Psalms, you know, Psalms verse 20 and verse one, may the name of the God of Jacob protect you. You know, it ain't the, the, the magical spelling or pronunciation. No, it's the representation and character of God itself. When people seen, you know, the Israelites, Oh, that they're, that's the God, uh, Yahweh, 
That, that's the God they serve. Remember what he did to those guys in Egypt? Right. Don't mess with him. The he built a reputation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it's saying. That's where the protection lies. You know, Psalms 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and horses. We trust in the name of the Lord. We trust in the rep, you know, representation and the reputation. You know, it's mentioned chariots and horses. It's calling back again, you know, to Egypt. To Egypt, yep. You know, Psalms, uh, the last one, uh, Psalms 9, 10. Those who know your name put their trust in you, and you have not forsaken those who seek you. Let me say it again. You have not forsaken those who seek you. So if we seek them and call them by happily the wrong verbiage of a name, we're still not forsaken. No, he will he not still knows. forsake you if you are seeking. I think as we go along and we jump into the kind of the next uh, portion of this, as we jump into this uh, uh, next portion that we'll kind of see what, really matters what changes the game you know what i mean now are you about ready to jump in i'm that? i'm right. i was born ready all right i'm gonna tee it up for you i think he's itching i'm gonna tee it up for you uh when i was doing this i found these last few verses and i'm not even gonna lie i texted you guys uh the holy spirit just flooded over the top of me i was in tears trying to to p put this on paper and i I had already gotten it, you know what I mean? But I got it from a whole new perspective. It brought me to a, a whole new level. And it was just, uh, you know, like you guys were talking about, you know, the, the feeling that, that you get and you know that God is there. And uh, I'll try not to let my Southern Baptist preacher come out of me right now. I'll, if I start yelling, I'll back up from the mic. <laughs> uh, we'll run, don't worry. But... John chapter 17, verse 5, he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of this world. You know, he manifested your name, your reputation. He manifested it. He was the perfect lamp, right? That's what's kind of hinting at there. You know, it says he came to fulfill the law. He was the only one that could live up to the name, character, or reputation of God. It says it outright. He manifested it. And because he did, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 happened. You were washed, you were sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus Christ. And his last words on the cross, it is finished. That was what was finished, you know. Now, if you look at Acts chapter 10, verse 43, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It ain't that you said his name right. What it is is, once again, the representation, the character, the reputation. And basically the, how I understood that is he vouches for us. You know, kind of like think about uh, the, those mafia movies. You know, you do this for me, you're going to be a, a made man. If you don't, if you, you get do a this, horse head. If you do this for him, he's going to vouch for you, and nobody's going to mess with you like a big brother. And that's that's how I understood that. Luke chapter 12, verse 8 it also says, Deny me before men, and I'll deny you before the Father and his angels. He stands before us in front of the divine council, and because of his name, his reputation, we are allowed in because he vouches for us. Praise God. Yep. Not that we earned it. Not that we're cool enough to get in. Oh, no. Not even the close. Cool, the cool kid brings us in with him. Right. We ain't got the money to yeah. pay the cover charge. <laughs> he covers it for us. And, oh, my God, it brought goosebumps all over me. There's no power in letters or vowels. It don't matter how you pronounce it. If you're looking there, man, you're missing the point. If that's what you put your faith in. You're going to be sadly mistaken. You're going to be like the Jewish exorcist in Acts 19. When they try to cast out this demon in Jesus' name, the demon looks right at him and says, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? It says that they ran out naked, wounded, and afraid. They put their trust 
in the wrong thing. They weren't true believers. They weren't representing the name. Or are you going to be like the ones in Revelations that stand before the throne and proclaim, didn't we do great works in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we prophesy in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. The name didn't save either one of those two guys. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, that, that hits the nail on the head. That's kind of a nice way to sum that up because it doesn't, that's not the deciding factor. You have to have the faith. Yeah. It reminds me kind of like the Left Behind movies. You know, one of them, the preacher, was still there after the rapture. He he knows the words. He he preached all the time. His congregation went to heaven, but it's like he didn't truly have the faith and believe it for himself. Think about think about who knows God better than anybody. True. Probably Satan. Right? He's up there. Uh, he was he's part of the original, you know, divine council. He as as intimate knowledge of God, he's been there since God created him, and he's not going to heaven. No, nope. but he's got better knowledge of God than anybody here on earth. That right there tells you tells you right there that a knowledge of God or or knowing God's name or knowing those things is not what gets you to heaven. That's not what gets you there. Not even close, because you have to have and. and we're going to get into that a little more. You have to have faith. Well, Stephen, I guess that tees it up. Where, where, in your opinion, does the power lie? Well, this is something that I've been working on for a while, and I think if uh, if if this was um, done even a few weeks later, we probably would have written a book by now. But um, <laughs> I, I tell you, it's something that dra- it draws me back every time I I get into the scripture, get into the word. Something brings me back to this, and it's not not even just that, but some of the um, other authors that we've read and, and gotten involved with have really brought me back to this. But why is it that everything in the Bible always gets brought back to the blood? Right? We talked about with Ryan Peterson, and we're going to go through a few of these things, but I'll give you a little overview. You know, we talked a little bit about Ryan Peterson, about the bloodline. Well, are we going to go back Southern Baptist here? Uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. power, power, wonder-working power. In the blood. In the blood. Of the land. Of the land. <laughs> okay, sorry. okay. We just got a recording deal, fellas. All right, no. <laughs> You okay over there? You choked me up a little bit. Sorry, sorry. I can't say power. I mean, it's, Pyr, you know. Purr. Purr. Anyway. Purr? Purr. No. But purr. It's power lines over this place. Anyway. He's just trying. No, I, I can't, I can't speak Yankee. your language. No. I have no clue what it, you're saying. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. I think. Um. Anyway, in the Bible... You know, we, we, we always get drawn back to the blood. You see that from day one. Like I said, you, you see it with the bloodline. You see it how in Genesis 6, the Nephilim, you know, the whole point was to corrupt the bloodline. It's all about the blood. Why is it all about that blood? What, it, what is there? What, why is the blood so important? And we, as we get further along, you'll see sacrifice and then... You you obviously see in the end the ultimate sacrifice being Jesus. But in the beginning when God created everything, he created everything perfect, right? He created everything exactly how it was supposed to be. He looked at it and said it was good. So what is that? First of all, that tells you Adam and Eve were perfect. They were ideal. They were exactly how they're supposed to be. Their blood was perfect. Their DNA was perfect. I mean, it had God's fingerprints all over it, right? God did this. This is this is perfect. Same thing with the animals, obviously. And we, we talked about, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, here in a little bit. But when sin came, you know, perfection left this world. You know, after that, you know, God said, you're going to, you know, you're going to toil. You're going to, it's going to be tough. You know, childbearing is going to be painful. All these different things are going to happen. 
things got worse, right? Sin happened, but then when you get to that Genesis 6 event, you see that the, the, the watchers, those, those fallen angels came down. And they had intercourse with, you know, or they copulated. I was about to correct but you. You go ahead. You sing it. Sing it once. No, no. Okay. Never mind. All right. Anyway. Copulation, <laughs> baby. So they copulated with, uh, with those, with those uh, human women. And we went into that in great detail uh, with Ryan Peterson about this bloodline and, and about, you know, uh, Nama most likely being the, the mother of the first Nephilim, you know, as far as um, the, the daughter of uh, Lamech. Tubal Cain's sister, right? We talked about all this before, but um, going in there, that that DNA, the whole point was to corrupt the bloodline, to 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 stop God's prophecy, God's God's covenant that He made even with Eve, saying that you know eventually, you know, out of your bloodline will come the Messiah. As indirectly, the way that He said it, when He says that, it's almost like He severed our connection with the divine, or at least that's what he was trying to do because, you know, Adam was an inanimate object until he breathed the breath of life in him, you know, and he was the, the first and only besides Jesus, Beneha Elohim, son, a direct son of God. And it's like he had to mess with that bloodline almost to kind of maybe sever a connection that we had. I, I would say in this, once again, we're going to have different opinions on things. I'd say, I wouldn't say necessarily the, first son of God. I think those sons of God as a whole were there, but I think he's the first human son of God. Yeah, that's what that I was way. saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But flesh. Flesh. Son okay. of God. Because I, I believe he was part of that in the beginning that way. But but what happened is, you know, obviously that 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 um, the degradation of our DNA, the degradation and sin and then obviously entropy and you know, with sin comes entropy. Everything worsens over time. Everything gets worse. Everything downplays to the point where, you know, that DNA got so bad that the flood had to happen, right? And, you know, we fast forward a little bit to Noah when we talk about the bloodline. And what does is, what is, uh, uh, God say about Noah? Well, he was Tamim. Tamim. Now, that same word is the word that the uh, Jews would use for the a sacrificial lamb or a goat that they came that was the term meaning it was pure and the english that word was translated as righteous you know didn't mean he was perfect sinless it was yeah referring to the yeah, it wasn't, sacrificial system blood yes it was yes. the blood sacri- it was the, the blood perfection right it's not a moral perfection noah wasn't perfect by no stretch but his blood his bloodline was perfect. That's how God was preserving that covenant. And if, and I don't know. I've been doing a Bible study with my family um, lately where we're going through Genesis. And if if you see in the first, we're, what, through like 25 chapters or so. And I would say that God has, has reconfirmed that covenant. For, you know, first, you know, he has the covenant with, with uh, Eve, and then he goes down, and we have the covenant with Abraham, and we have the covenant with, um, or I'm sorry, with Noah, then Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and he just keeps saying, you know, you're... And they're all so similar. Yes. It's all, you know, be blessed, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. It's like repeating cycles. And you will have descendants as numerous as the sands of the seashore, you know, or the stars in the sky, and he just keeps reestablishing that covenant. So it's talking about that pure bloodline that's coming down, right, from Adam all the way down to the Messiah. That's the whole point when we get to that point. When we even get to and that, that part that I – and I, just one of my favorite parts of that Peterson book was that Judah and Tamar because I didn't ever look at it that way. When you talk about how God used that to keep that bloodline pure because Judah had originally – you know, it always talks about that, um, you know, that – from Judah will come, you know, the Messiah first, they don't come from the line of David, the line of Judah down the way. But God, Judah married a Canaanite woman. All his sons were half Canaanite, right? So God uses Tamar, his first son's wife, and ends up in the end coming back around so that she fools Judah into sleeping with her. Two that are not Canaanite to have a, a child that that pure bloodline lives through. I mean, it is crazy. This, you can't make this stuff up. This is like Jerry Springer on steroids. I mean, it's insane. And that all this stuff happens just to keep that bloodline pure. Blood is so important. 
all the way through and you can see it through that. It's just, it's unreal how you see that bloodline and, and uh, the Bible gives us, and that's something that I always thought was boring before was reading those genealogies. But yeah. now I see that that's a gift. It shows us. It is. It's there for a reason. It's there to show us how that bloodline was passed down all the way from Adam all the way to Jesus. Right. So we see that path that we know that blood was pure. And and we get down there and we talked about it. And I, I'm not going to go too far into that because it'll it'll wear you out. But the the um, that. Peterson, um, when we talk to him about this and we really get into that bloodline stuff, it just gets, it's just so good. I just go back and listen to that. That is such his insights. His is it, just so good. Um, I'm looking forward to doing that one again sometime. But uh, when we go through and we start looking at uh, corruption was not even with, not all, not Sorry, not just with people, but it was also with animals. And we looked at that with some of the extra biblical texts when we talk about Jasher and like the Book of Giants, Jubilees. You see that that blood of everything, and it says that all flesh was corrupt, right? So all all blood, and all things against had the been beasts sinned. of the field and birds of the air. You know, exactly. Modern genome splicing and you know, manipulation that's going on today. So interesting and this is kind of a little rabbit trail but when we get to genesis 9 right post flood noah i'm gonna get off the boat it's time to get off god says it's time to get off we're gonna get out and we're gonna go do our thing god gives them a couple commands and and the date which we touched that we on did Noah's yeah that flood. but for those that missed it i mean dates are important too they are very important the day that it gives if it gives you a date it's for a reason <laughs> That's the day that uh, Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. So when they got off the boat, that was the start of something new. Mm-hmm. When Jesus came out of the tomb, that was definitely the start new, of something new. A new, new beginning. A new yeah. beginning. 100%. It's crazy. So, well, God puts all that together. It's like a puzzle that you, like you said it before, you know, you have this puzzle piece here and you're looking at it. You can't, you can't make out what that one puzzle piece is until you have them all on the table and you put that puzzle together, then all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, that's unbelievable. All that fits together. It changes the whole perception of the entire picture. Yes. That one piece can. So Genesis 9, 2 through 6, right? All the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the animals that scurry along the ground and all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them for you for food, just as I have given you grain and vegetables. But you must never eat meat that still has life blood in it. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. And I think that this is the command, and there's a couple different rabbit trails you can take off of this. But um, obviously we're talking about how important and and, and the different um, aspects of blood here. But I I think that it's interesting, and I've never really thought about it this way. We've, We've talked numerous times about how the Nephilim and different things got through the flood. But it's interesting that he's getting off the boat and he's already telling you not to eat the blood in certain animals instantly, right then. So just interesting that potentially is because that... Because also, I mean, the what lives in water? The fish, yeah. Well, and that's the fish without scales thing and... and Where's the Leviathan come from? In Revelation, where does all the beasts and stuff come from? The abyss. The sea, the abyss. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, he didn't have to build a bunch of <coughs> fish tanks and stuff like that on the ark because it was bringing water. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I really do think that something it's came a good that possibility that, the, that that's the how path. the gene come through. And that's maybe why in the, some of the Levitical laws it says you're not to eat fish without mm-hmm. scales and stuff like that. I mean, could be. I mean, I, I, I 100% agree, but I've thought that. I've thought that for a long time. This is it's always been one of my favorite subjects to Merman. think about. Merman, who knows? Who knows? Anyway. You know, like we was discussing earlier, who who would come up with that? 
So going a little further down the, the chronology here as we're going, I'm jumping into Deuteronomy, and we start talking about Deuteronomy, and then you can go in, even into the Levitical laws and things when we talk about the, um, and we will talk about sacrifice in a little bit, but when we first, it says right here, Deuteronomy 12, 23, never consume the blood, for the blood is the life. You must not consume the lifeblood with the meat. Instead, pour out the blood on the ground like water. Do not consume the blood so that all may go well with you and your children after you, because what you're doing will please the Lord. So God's given us strict instructions. There's something about the blood here that you're seeing right away, right? First of all, we're not supposed to consume that blood, right? And if you look back through... Um, you know, stories about the Nephilim and we look in the book the of Amalekites Giants. And, and said they devoured the inhabitants of the land. And they drank their blood. That's the point is they drank the blood because they would think that drinking, and this is a kind of an ancient, <laughs> ancient world theory, was if you drank the blood of your enemies, you took on their power. You took their life force. It's just like people hunting and they're like, oh, you got to drink eat the heart or drink the blood or whatever going full liver king huh As, well I'm, yeah i mean just you know you see it in movies and such oh, yeah. you know and then which that one movie uh what was it dances with wolves where he eats the no, buff no that's a tongue he eats never mind no it's uh red dawn that new one they it's just you know like a one of the boys school buddies they it kills his first deer he's like oh you gotta drink its blood you know it's it's you know becoming a man you killed your first deer and he drinks it he's like oh it don't taste too bad they're like uh he's like well you you know what i mean he goes no we never did that <laughs> but but you know it's that kind of you don't well, the do whole that. vampire what stories is, too i mean yeah. that, that, that's what they done they drunk the blood to regenerate right. and rejuvenate themselves but look again know? look again so something god forbid against and we're seeing in our pop culture today uh, extremely oh yeah huge right. in our All culture the whole today. adrenochrome stuff too but you know it is but that you look at there's vampires everywhere you know and in all the different movies and they're romanticized they're they're turned into the hero. They're turned into the or the whatever you want to call. It, I want to be like anti hero yeah. or whatever you want to call it. But they're they're bad because they they they're drink bad, someone's but blood, good, but bad. they save somebody's life, yeah. so they're yeah. okay. The Breaking Dawn series, they sparkle and they they love. And it's it, it to me, Breaking it just shows Dawn. you how that stuff is translating into our culture. The vampire romance novels and movies. Uh, wasn't that get out front of your rock? No, man. that's not. What was that called? That was called... Um, Wasn't it Breaking Dawn? No. no. That's... Twilight. Twilight, my bad. Yeah. Now I need to get on Close enough. Rock. Breaking Dawn, Twilight, yeah, whatever. So, Wasn't that so one of the with, books, though, in the series? Oh, that's the book that you read, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. He didn't, he didn't have no rebuttal, so I'm just... <laughs> As we keep going along, I'm editing that out. That's okay. I got the power. That, That's that is, okay. you do have the power. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talk about further going along the the corruption of that blood. You know, after the flood, where God tells. Um, the, you know, the Israelites go in and kill every man, woman, and child. And I think that's really important, and that we've talked about that before, but I think that's super important that people understand, you know, God is a God of love. God is a God of, of um, you know, he, he wants the best for us. But at that point, if you're not, um, if, you're, if you're DNA, you're not truly, even Donald agrees. Yeah, even Donald agrees watching. Uh-huh, yeah. If, uh, if, see, I, I'm losing my whole train of thought. Suck the air out of the I buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you're told, the whole thing is that if, with especially during the Exodus and, and when you talk about when they're going into the, the, the land of Canaan and they're told to kill all these different tribes and kill each one of these, it's really important to understand why that is because otherwise people look at God and say, oh, man, that's terrible. That's awful. Why would God they killed say all that? People. Or, or maybe the church skips over some of that because they, it's a, it's a touchy subject. Like, oh, we don't want to talk about. They're that. missing that puzzle piece. It's that puzzle piece that shows you these people aren't even human anymore. These are, these are, 
these are abominations to God because it's that DNA still from those that that fallen angels that that have corrupted their DNA so that it, it, they're not what God created. They're so far removed from uh, um, from creation, from perfection, that they're an abomination to God, which is the same reason the flood had to come. I mean, it goes right back to then. So, and he can't flood the world because he already said that he wouldn't do it. Another again. covenant that he made. Right. So therefore, I tell you what, still got to kill them all. You know why God is one of the reasons God's so awesome is that if you read through and you really look at it, God makes a promise. I swear, every five minutes when you're reading the Bible, and guess what? He never breaks it. He makes a promise. He shows you that covenant that he makes with those people all over and over and over again. And even though they keep screwing up, especially so the he's Exodus. He's got a good reputation. He's got a good reputation. He's a, he's a man of his word. But I tell you, God, you go through and look how many times the Israelites um, fell away. Over oh, yeah. and over and over. You know, they're worshiping a golden calf or they're. You know, it's just something different. You know, they fall away to the idols of some other country and they're worshiping those idols. And God still always, because he had a covenant. And he had a plan. He knew they would. He knew they would. But he had a covenant with Abraham that had said that it, your, your descendants will be. So he couldn't kill them all off because he had a covenant. He had a promise. And he fulfilled that promise. He kept true to his word and he always will. And I think that's extremely important. But, um,. Now, jumping in a little bit, now going a little bit next to kind of the next part of blood, when I say, I think the bloodline stuff, extremely important, extremely fascinating. Listen to the Ryan Peterson episode. He is, there's a couple parts. Even the Tim Stedman one. And Tim, Tim, yeah, blood. Tim went into that a lot too, but I, just such good stuff, such good insights. I would recommend reading both of their books. Um the, the um, answers to giant questions and then the, the final Nephilim and the judgment of the Nephilim just just and Tori she won our contest for the final Nephilim got that in the mail sorry for the delay but it's in the mail it's in the mail hopefully by the time you hear this it's in your hands this isn't going to air for another three years no I'm just kidding it's giving them time, <laughs> it's giving them time. to get in the mail <laughs> anyway I got a good reputation too. Well, you got to keep it. That's why you got to keep it. Anyway, going into sacrifice. Now, I think this is this is a really important thing when we talk about blood, okay? Because there's and you we talked about this a little bit before we started, but um, sac you know there's a there's a lot of debate on sacrifice when it started, who it was to. Um, that was another thing that I thought Tim Stedman really was kind of blew my mind on that. When I, when I first really, you know, when he brought that up, the Cain and Abel. But, you know, there's a lot of debate over the first sacrifice. You know, I was always taught that it was the, the animal skins, you know, that they say was given to Adam and Eve. Not everybody believes that. There's some things in the translation. Um, but the animal skins supposedly that God gave Adam and Eve when they left the garden, it says he clothed them, basically. Um, I always, I always kind of was taught that that was, uh, you know, a sacrifice to cover their shame. That was kind of the first sacrifice there. Once again, not everybody, you know, that's that's neither here nor there exactly. But um, when we were talking, to, and I actually have that written down right here, talking to Tim Stedman, and brought up the possibility that Abel, when 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 Cain became jealous of of God's acceptance of his offerings, and how he was prospering and he wasn't exactly ended up being a sacrifice to potentially, and we, we talked about Mott or potentially even Baal, like he was sacrificing Abel potentially for the same thing that, you know, he's instead of bringing that gift of, uh, of his first fruits, as they say, he was sacrificing his brother for a fertile land because God wasn't listening to him in his idea, right? In his mentality, God wasn't listening to him. Right. He God said, since you're going to ignore me, I'm going to go over here to this exactly. guy. This other yeah. God to bless me. Right. And if you look at it, it's interesting because when you read that, it do shows. Do you remember the verbiage that he used? Because he said that there was something with the, the Hebrew words that pointed towards sacrifice i can't remember but he told us in that show he's given you he's given you a a, a subconscious thought to go watch listen to that one too <laughs> no i don't remember the verbiage but i will say that i thought it was interesting because when he looks at it 
and he we were talking about it it doesn't say that it was a you know a crime of passion it doesn't show that yeah. what it, it shows happened in one day. it looks like you know it was something that was premeditated it said one day while they were out in the field it doesn't say that it happened right after yeah this it could was, have been like two or three months six months yeah. it could have been two years later yeah. we don't know but the whole thing is it was premeditated like this was set up like he was going to kill him but the the idea that it potentially was a sacrifice that his blood and then what what is what does god say you know i think it's pretty cool when you see that god was still talking to them right and and cain was not surprised when god talked to him right but what does god say to cain oh he says your brother's blood cries out from the ground what have you done i mean he obviously already knew what he'd done mm -hmm. and i've heard some people talking uh one of them is uh uh Kenny C, you know, he talks on frequencies. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some other podcasters and stuff talk about how there's frequencies in everything. You know, that there's even measurable frequencies in your blood that, you know, that's, you know, possibly what God was hearing, the frequencies from Abel's blood crying out from the ground because that's where he poured it because it was a sacrificial thing. Blood was the life force. He was sacrificially pouring the blood of his brother onto the ground it, to on fertilize the it, Kinda to like, bless it. That's like the Vikings would yes, do. And get the crops to grow. Yeah. Yep. That's pretty w wild to There's a lot of cultures think about. did that. Now, I think, and kind of piggybacking on that, if we look at sacrifice throughout history, you'll see, and, you know, we can go into, uh, like, Leviticus, not far after what we're just talking about, not eating the lifeblood, Leviticus uh, uh, 22 through 5 talks about sacrificing to Molech, right? And ta sacrificing their children to Molech. And that's, it's, it says, if any of them offer their children as sacrifice to Molech, they must be put to death. The people of the community must stone them to death. I myself will turn against them and cut them off from the community because they have defiled my sanctuary and brought shame on my holy name by offering their children to Molech. That was Cain's curse too. He was cut off from the community, exiled. Kind of interesting. interesting. I just that, now kind of put connection. that together. Hmm. But if you look throughout history, then we can look at the Sumerian texts, right? Like the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we see that, you know, what Gilgamesh and Enkidu, they rip out the heart of the bowl of heaven and give it as a gift to the, the, the sun god Shamash. And, and you, you see this throughout the, when we talk about sacrifice, right? When, and we'll talk about God's sacrifice a little bit too. Um, but when you look at sacrifice, it's usually uh, in the, the perverted sense of it, it's, it's a gift of the, some god to appease them. Right. To to either please send us rain, you know, so our crops are fertile or please don't let there be a famine or don't let there be this or, you know, please spare us or don't let the volcano erupt with your anger. You know, you know, Pompe don't Pompeii us or something. You know what I mean? Something to that nature. Yeah. Quasi kettle. All those depictions of all those uh, sacrifices, ripping the heart out at the top of the temple and giving it to the feathered serpent to eat. Temple you know of I mean? Doom. Yeah. Kalima. Kalima. <laughs> I love that movie. That's such a good movie. Uh, but you talk about that with this, with that, or you talk about the Greek myth, you know, uh, King Agamemnon. I still never say that right. But he sacrificed his daughter to Artemis as payment for letting the Greek fleet sail to Troy. I mean, you see this throughout history, especially the human sacrifice. Um, but when you talk about something from the true historical record as, a fo as opposed to like those myths, if you look at the... The Chinese Shang Dynasty, which was from um, uh, 1600 B.C. to 1000 B.C., they found ritual pits, and we're going to get into ritual pits here in a minute, but ritual pits showing human sacrifice in, in the Yingzhou, uh, where there was approximately 13,000 people sacrificed there in, a, in about a 200-year sp uh, span. So you're seeing human sacrifice throughout history, and I, I think that's interesting. Uh, very negative and not good, but interesting. Um, when the this is the one that kind of blew my mind, and um, I had to I saw this somewhere, then I had to go back and look up and verify at a couple different spots for myself because it was kind of blew me away. But when the Great Pyramid of uh, Tenochtitlan was consecrated in eighteen or I'm sorry in fourteen eighty seven by the Aztecs, it was recorded by them that 
84,000 people were sacrificed in four days. That's a lot of blood. That's a, I actually, you know what's funny? I was going to sit down and do the math and how many a minute that was going to be. But you think about that. It'd be a slaughter. How many people were, 84,000 in four days? I mean, why, people don't do that just because they decide, oh, you know, I'm going to, you know, we, we talk about that a lot with the, um, you know, the two separate commandments, thou shall not have any gods before you and the thou shall not commit a, a idolatry, right? No worship, no other idols. So there's obviously a distinction there. Oh, yeah. That, one's at, one's real and one is stone or wood. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. He, he definitely differ, they're, they're separate for the two. Yeah, they're separate for a reason. Uh, well, and do you think that somebody, if I was to go and carve a, a wood statue, you know what, today I think, uh, this week we'll sacrifice 84,000 people to my wood carving I made last week. That, uh, I'm that, down. I'm down. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. in. Yeah. No, that doesn't make any sense. Whose car I, are we going to take? Yeah. <laughs> this shows you. And I this volunteer. Is something, and we go back and we talk about this, that those lowercase g deities, those 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 ones that we talk about all the time that, that show these powers uh, to these other, how did the Israelites fall away so easy? Because these other lowercase g gods that they fell away to these other countries could do things. They saw miraculous things. Yeah, they obviously. weren't for God's good, but they saw miraculous things. And, and, and the part where we can see that the most is we go back to Egypt once again, and we see that Pharaoh's magicians, can, you know, they could turn their staves into serpents. They could make the, the, the water into blood. They could bring frogs out of the Nile. They couldn't do everything God could do, but, but there was just... You, you can see that they had some power limited compared to God, but they had some power. So these people will be swayed by, for lack of a better word, parlor tricks. Cause, Oh, look what this God can do. Look what this God can do. And that's how they fall away over and over again. Well, I love how Enoch says, you know, you thought you had wisdom and oh. knowledge, but you know, the worthless ones. Exactly. You know, God didn't give you the full secrets of heaven. To the dropouts. Exactly. Like Dickie Joy said, why are you getting your knowledge from these guys? These guys didn't even finish ninth grade. They're dropouts. Even the knowledge they do got it is just half, you know, half knowledge. Why would you get your, you know, uh, information from a bunch of, you know, divinity dropouts? But I, I think this, and it, 100% true, but I think what, what it's important to see is that as we go a little further and we see the, that, you know, God also, um, you know, he, when we look at the Levitical law and we talk about the fact that there was, there was multiple different kinds of sacrifices that, that God, you know, requested. There was, um, you know, there was the sin offering, the guilt offering, the um, grain offering. I think there was five different ones that I wrote down. I can't remember every one, but there was... Uh, have it written down somewhere the burnt offering the grain offering the peace offering the sin offering and the guilt offering which is funny because the guilt offering most people would think that's for you know something morally wrong you did but it was actually a, a reparation offering is more when we talk to um uh, gilbert which or not gilbert i'm sorry that's a michael heiser thing i was watching a thing on him with that and it's pretty interesting when he went through these and he talks about it and and i love and we all in this space, love Michael Heiser, and we absolutely hope the best for him and his family through the hard times they're going through right now. Um, and keep them in your prayers. But um, I'm going to read just a little bit. This is kind of a, a, a paraphrase of, of something that, um, of a presentation he did, but I'm going to, just a small, small part of it. But he says, multiple types of offerings were offered to God, but they weren't ever for moral sin. The language of the Levitical law was about making a person acceptable to enter the system of worship because they became ritually defiled, not morally defiled, but ritually through something that was unavoidable in life, like blood loss, seminal emission, a menstrual period, touched a dead body, had a baby, even had a skin rash. The system was made so that they would not defile a sacred space. After one of these instances, they would have to bring an offering and wait an allotted time to go through a procedure that would make them acceptable to return to that, that same worship they had before. 
So you see already that, like, for example, there was no sacrifice for adultery or idolatry for that matter. Um, and this is one of uh, two, uh, two of my uh, favorite things when we talk at sacrifice. He had two quotes, and I'm quoting him verbatim on these, but this is the deficiency of the law and the superiority of the gospel. And I thought that was such a good way to put it, is showing that sacrifice that you see the deficiency of the law because it doesn't take care of us morally. It doesn't I mean, change us morally. If it was perfect, why, why a new one? You know, If the law was perfect, why did Christ have to come and change it? Well, and that's the next quote that he had. It says, because the sacrifice of Christ covers everything. And those two things right there, I mean, that's enough to get you kick-started with your faith right there. But it's just so cool to see. And I love that, that phrase that, that when he says this, this is the deficiency of the law and the superiority of the gospel. I don't think you can say it much more plainly than that, but I just absolutely loved that and thought that was, you know, you got to give a lot of props to Michael Heiser and being able to break that down and kind of show us the verbiage that, um, you know, in a way that we can't translate it to show us, uh, you know, that other side of things. But this is, this is a little bit, um, you know, when we talk about other gods, uh, uh, as far as the lowercase g gods, don't get me, there's only one true God. We always talk about this, but we talk about those lowercase g gods, those other fallen angels. The way I like to look at it, and I want your guys, obviously, opinion on this, but the way I like to look at it is I look at it as like a, um, a, a mirror of God, right? They try, to, they try to imitate what God does because they want the worship. They want the affection of the people. And when they realize that they don't have the power that God does, the awesome power that God does, they end up using things like fear um, through requiring things like human sacrifice, through requiring things that um, something God would never ask for, actually even warned against, forbid against. But these other, they required this, and for a couple reasons, but personally, I think one of them is really important, and we talk, We can go back to the, the, the um, parable of the prodigal son when we talk about, you know, the angels being the yeah, big brother, older. the older brother, and that we're the younger brother. Because in that parable, we're the ones that screwed up. They're filthy and dirty. And yes. We're the ones that sinned. And they believe they're superior, and so they're angry. When we come back, they're angry. So those angels, those fallen angels, those same ones that are masquerading as gods to all these other nations, to the Aztecs, to the Mayans, to the, to the Greeks, to the Romans, the ones that are masquerading as these gods, they're not only, not only are they trying to say, well, you know what? God has his sacrifices. We have ours. See, I think that's why they require the sacrifice, because they hate us. Well, I think that's part of it. They want See, to destroy that's, that's, God's creation I think because they, they hate us. Or... Or not necessarily destroy, but if they say, okay, worship me, but I'm going to require you to kill your children, now you're doing something against God. Well, it's open rebellion. Right. Yes. So so it's like you're choosing sides, not just being wishy-washy. I'm going to go with you today. And you have to. And you tomorrow. We're yeah. in the midst of oh, a, a war. Oh, well, of course. And you're that's what to, I think. There is no Switzerland. I think you're going to have to choose a side. <laughs> I think that's the whole point of the the human sacrifices and the different things that they would have you do is to make you prove yeah, choose you're with day them. Yeah, who you serve. That's right. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, you can't serve two masters. A hundred percent. So that it, hatred drives them to the point right. that they want. Like I think that they get enjoyment out of when they had that human sacrifice. It's the same thing, you know. When it said in those sacrifices that when you burn the fat, you know, the the aroma was pleasing, pleasing. to the Lord. When those fallen angels, those other lowercase g deities, that's pleasing to them. That's pleasing to them to have a human sacrificed, and that is because it's it's because God it's mocking them. Not yeah, exactly. God, yeah, it's kind of like spitting, spitting spit on them or something, and, and seeing you know they hate us. Yeah, 
They hate us. Well, they at the same time, us, they're they kill, they're killing us on top of it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I, think and I think that's a huge thing that we talk that we need to see there. But <laughs> because they can't kill God, I think Obviously. because it says we are divine imagers. You know, you're not to kill another divine imager because metaphorically you're killing God. Well, and they, they can't do that. So the next best thing is us. Well, what we'll, we'll look at it. Look at it to this effect. Job. The devil couldn't do nothing to Job until God gave him permission. But we have choice. So if I can talk you into killing you, I didn't do it. Oh, it's a contract loophole. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And I think that's just. And if they if they despise us, then I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna get you to worship me while I get you to kill more people like you that I despise anyways. So it's a win-win and it's also unpleasing to God himself. So, but you think you got to remember though, same thing. So when we look at God, God used the blood of those sacrifices as a purification, right? It was a substitution for us. And it's the same thing. If you look at, for example, one of the best cases, and this is another Heiser ism, if you want to say it, but one of the best cases for a substitution is the Passover lamb, right? When we're back in Egypt and the angel of death is coming, what is it that saved the firstborn of the Israelites? It was the blood. The blood of the lamb. Yep. A tav painted on their door. On their door. On their door. So you see again the importance of the blood, the the, and not only not only there is I think the blood is so important, but you're seeing that, that um, the substitution for us for our sin, but you're seeing the forecoming again of Jesus. It's the same thing, the Passover. You're seeing that, the Lamb giving up His life for us. Right. And you know we see that throughout the Bible in different places, how, you know, the, the lamb is sacrificed, the lamb, and that's where the Tamim, we can go back into the Tamim and talk about the, the perfection. I mean, was it Abraham who had to go up and sacrifice his son? Isaac. Isaac. It's right there. God said, stop, I'll provide the sacrifice. And then they say that's the same hilltop that Jesus died on the cross at. Yeah, that was which with, is uh, wild. Yeah. yeah, that one was that one kind of threw me. I mean, through yeah. and he was I mean, going to gloss right over that, and I'm like, well, and I told like, him, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. So, yeah. yeah, what? <laughs> but I mean, it's just the foreshadowing of it all, even. All right, real. We're going to jump into the next part here. There is a couple things that. Um, I think that it's uh, well, actually one more verse that kind of relates to that and why the hatred and, and, and things of that there. I think this is kind of important. If you look at first Corinthians six, two and three, it says, and we talk about big brother, hating little brother a little bit here. Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world. Can't you even decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? Ooh. I tell you what. The ones that have uh, transgressed have, here. Have chosen right. their path. And right. I listened to uh, Timothy Alberino. Now, he's got a lot of good thoughts. I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff, but he's oh, I think he's great, great on a lot of stuff. And I loved, I heard him talk, and he said, a lot of people get that misconstrued that we're going to be exalted above the angels. He said, my opinion, he said, is we were given dominion of earth. This is what we have dominion over. These angels came down to our dominion and transgressed. He said, those are the ones, he said, that I believe that scripture is talking about that we will judge. He said, a lot of people want to say, well, no, when we go to heaven, when it's all over with, we're going to rule over the angels and everybody. He says, I think that's bad theology. He said, we, he said, they have dominion of heaven. We have dominion of earth. He said, they came into our dominion, so they, they are they under come our, into our law. Oh, they come into our territory. He said, so like if you go to you know Syria and commit right. a crime, yes, you're an American, and you can but, claim, I didn't know the law. That right. doesn't matter. You're still held accountable and judged under for their Syrian law. law. He yep. said, so they will be held accountable on earth for breaking our realm's law. 
I, don't, I thought I, that was pretty insightful. I've heard that makes sense. I've actually heard yeah. that. He, yeah, he, Timothy's got some some great insights. Um, and I keep emailing him. If anybody knows Tim, you know, put in a good word for me. He's I, I love listening to Tim. I think he's very interesting. I Like you said, I don't agree with him on everything, but I think that um, I love listening to him because he does. He makes me think. He make he stretches my mind a little bit, get, makes my mind exercise a little bit, which I really appreciate. I love that. If we all fought exactly the same way, this would be really boring, and you wouldn't need us to even dig into anything. But um, I guess the next step when we talk about this, when we talk about the blood, is the most important part, right? We're, we're seeing the importance of blood through the bloodline throughout history all the way through Jesus. We're seeing the, the importance of blood when we talked about sacrifice and how we're seeing it from the 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 side of of God and we're seeing it from the side of those fallen angels those those other lowercase g gods that we talk about we're seeing that that blood that kind of blood feud for it's the Hatfield McCoy side of things going back and forth there you're seeing that the blood is super important through there and then we're getting all the way now to salvation right so couple of couple of things first of all first John five six through eight says we must be born of must be born of water and of spirit. And the blood. And the blood. All three, Don't right? You be pointing your finger shoot. Oh, right? I'll, I'll finger shoot you. Thing. I'll finger shoot you right now. <laughs> Think about. Don't first make of me all, go get the real ones, boys. The. <laughs> Think about the last. Oh. Think about the last supper, right? Really important to think about. And, and we talk about this. We do this and in, in pretty much. Almost every church celebrates communion, right? They use it as one of their sacraments, or or at least Except as for a, George Washington. As a, that's true. George Washington <laughs> refused communion, but uh, I just keep plugging all these previous episodes. I know, I know. you're doing a really good job of it. He though. just kind of like stopped coming, didn't he? <laughs> but after after the preacher called him out, yeah. he just he said, "Nope, like, yeah, sorry, yeah, I got yeah, I gotta set a better example. I just won't show up." His wife kept going though. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I th- you got to look at this in the way that. Um, Sorry, now you got me all distracted again. <laughs> you think about Last Supper. We talk about the, uh, you know, when, when the, Jesus is with the disciples and he's saying, you know, this is my body, take and eat. This is my blood, take and drink, right? He's, he's metaphorically showing them what it takes to be saved. It's you have to believe in him. You, his blood is what saves you. You got to accept the blood. You have The marriage to. slash salt covenant. The, Thank you, Vicky Joy, right? And I think that is such an important thing that we see. And, you know, people go and we do communion in so many churches, right? And most churches have communion in one way or another. And a lot of us, I think, get lost on that and don't truly understand what that means. That, that you know, we maybe we just go through the motions. But communion, you know, it, 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 it is symbolic, you know, but... That's God giving us his blood, his salvation, his sacrifice. And I think that we have to, to, to really always remember, go back to that. What, what is the power? What saves us? When we talk about the power, where is the power? The power is in Jesus' blood. He died on the cross for us. I mean, without that, we don't go to heaven. You could say a name every different possible way in every language, and it wouldn't matter because you still would be imperfect. But because of Jesus' blood, because Jesus' blood was shed for us, then we have salvation. That changes the game. A name doesn't change the game. Jesus' blood changed the game. Our faith that Jesus did that for us is what changes the game. Jesus' reputation because he did that changes the game all those things that he did for us god gave his only begotten son i mean we could go through and every bible verse that we've that we've been uh, memorized since we were little kids it's basically beating that into our heads but at the same time how often do we stop and think about it oh yeah it's like what i was talking about you know i mean i didn't got the idea but looking at it from a different angle man it did it just hit me like a train and it's humbling it very and I, I, I have one of those moments, I, 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 like I said, about once a week where something just grabs me, and it's because I, I'm trying, and I'm, I'm not great at it, I'll be honest. He's but not I'm, forsaking you for seeking, right, like no, I talked about earlier. He's sure not, but I, you, I pray for it, and I want him to show me something, and I pray for it, and I pray for it, 
And it's funny because it'll always hit me when I'm not expecting it. And it takes me off guard. But I really appreciate it. I love it. It makes me so happy. But back again, going back into the sacrifices and talking about how the sacrifices weren't about for moral sin, right? It was, it was, it says in Hebrews 10, 4, right? The blood of bulls and goats don't take away sin. Only the blood of the lamb. Just so important. Um, what is this right here? I, okay. Hebrews, uh, I'm going to read a quick little ver- verse here. Um, and this is, this is the last thing I have on this altogether, but I, I'm going to read this. I shouldn't say verse. It's Hebrews 9, 11 through 22. And I just, from my point of view, I want to end on this and then you guys jump in wherever. But so Christ. I got one thing here after he's done with this. Do you want to go ahead? Well, it's, it goes to the the Jesus dying on the cross, his blood, right? So you sent me the link there the other day of Ryan Peterson's little Thursday night theology, theology thing, right? So he he this is his take on it. He says the we're in Revelations, right? And it says, and I saw a strong angel shouting with a loud voice. This is what chapter five, verse two. Who is worthy to break the seal of the scroll and open it? But no one on no one in heaven, on the earth, under the earth was able to open the scroll. Right? He thinks this event happened when Christ died on the cross. Yeah, I think it was right after the ascension. Right. right. Well, well, whichever, yeah. you know. And he says, and then I began to weep because, you know, no one was found worthy. And then it says Stop weeping. Look, the line of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne, has won the victory. So therefore, it was him dying on the cross that gave him the power of everybody, spiritual realm or earthly realm, all of it, to be able to take the scroll. Which we talked about. I mean, was, I mean we, that's we just be the land deed. Yeah, I mean, it could be... Dominion of Earth, because where we traded it. Right. I mean, it's just... I, I've i always was taught for this, which this is a whole different episode, you know, that it all kind of happens in sequence all at one time. But like we, we talked... Yeah, time's not um, linear to God. Yeah, the whole one day to a thousand years. God's outside of you space know, it, and it's, time. You know, it could be all the same. Yep. But anyhow, as with the the blood part. All right. Now, I guess I'll leave everybody with this. But Hebrews 9, 11 through 22. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which is not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most high place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God. I'm sorry. Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is not the one who mediates a new covenant between God and the people. So all that who are called can receive the internal inheritance of God as he has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins they have committed under that first covenant. Now, when someone leaves a will, it will necessarily, um, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death, while the person who is made, who is I'm sorry. Well, the person who made it is still alive. The will cannot be put into effect. That is why the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses 
had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the bloods of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both on the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Thanks, everybody. Keep on digging. So what you're saying is, there is power, power, wonder working power. In the blood, In the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. See you guys. <laughs>